We are continuing with the launch period for the Nintendo 64 with Nintendo Power issue 90 for September of 1996. And we are slim on games this issue, just five, but still a fair amount of ground to cover. So let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Donkey Kong Country 3, which I've um already reviewed. Kind of setting the bar for what we're facing this issue. In the letters column, we get a letter asking if developers are going to move their content or focus for games to the new generation of consoles. And, well, yeah, that's the plan for pretty much all the console manufacturers. Sega wants developers to do games for the Saturn, not for the Genesis. Nintendo wants people to start making games for the N64, as opposed to kind of hanging on to the Super Nintendo. And PlayStation, or Sony with the PlayStation, is trying to get existing developers to come do games for their console as well, either by porting their games from the Saturn, doing original games, or just straight up jumping ship entirely from the end, from the Nintendo to the PlayStation, as is going to happen with Square. And for that matter, Enix, eventually, they have as they have not yet merged. In the power charts, the N64 ranking is still being picked by Nintendo Power Editors, so we don't quite yet have like a really good response from readers and presumably also retailers as for what's selling yet, at least not that they're willing to share. We do have three new titles on the Super Nintendo rankings, though. We have Donkey Kong Country 3, Kirby Superstar, and the Arcade's Greatest Hits collection. Our genre ranking issue is also more for a collection a collection of titles with the Game Boy Arcade Classics 2 and ones We have some additional coverage with Wave Race 64 with information on stunts mode and finally, finally, some course maps. Now, Blast Core 64 is still very much in development, and so the article here is less coverage of the actual game itself as of like a full-on feature article and more a continued preview of the game, just showcasing the general vehicle types for the game, which we haven't gotten into previously, how they handle, along with some additional mechanics, like, for example, how saving is handled. It's done as an in-environment in thing by going to a particular location rather than just um, selecting an option off a menu. We have continuing coverage of Donkey Kong Country C3 with level maps for later in the game. As far as our comics go, not we sadly still do not have an original comic that's unique to Nintendo Power, and instead are continuing with the with excerpts from the Dark Horse Comics adaptation of the Shadows of the Empire novel. I don't even believe it's like the next pages from where we were before. It's just bits from here and there in the series. In classified information, we have a tip for Mega Man X3 with information on how to get Zero Super Weapon. Now, Super Star Wars has gotten a re-release on the Super Nintendo because we're at the end of that console's life and we're popping out the greatest hits. So we get some notes on the game. Epic Center News is a sad article, this issue, as they're announcing the se section is basically going on an indefinite hiatus. Essentially, because a lot of the games that they cover, though they don't say this explicitly, are jumping to the PlayStation 1 and the Saturn. Again, they don't phrase it that way, but knowing where things are going in advance with 2020 modern hindsight, it's clear that's the case. We, I hope that this section comes back when, you know, the Game Boy Advance comes around and it gets a boatload of RPGs, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We do get a bunch of news, though, on Wonder Project J2, which is, I suspect, is one of the things that helped give that game a cult following on uh, among import gamers and anime fans. In any case, the first game we are reviewing this issue is SimCity 2000. The Super Nintendo came in with a SimCity, so now it is going out with one. We have notes on each of the game scenarios, and the article also provides notes on the game's mechanics. Well, continuing with our down notes, let's just get this out of the way. SimCity 2000 is barely playable. I might even say it's 
unplayable on the Super Nintendo. The lack of mouse support, when the mouse was already been out, been out for a while now, makes doing things on this game city map immensely tedious. And the game is utterly incapable of the level of free scrolling that the PC version of, ga of the game would let you do. All of this is aggravated by the fact that this game was designed with the mouse above and beyond the ways that the original game was. Again, if this game had some Super Nintendo mouse support, that would alleviate the bit of this issue, but the problems with scrolling still makes this game a mess. In a lot of respect, the Super Nintendo version of SimCity 2000 shows just how far PCs have come at this point and how far they have blown 16-bit consoles out of the water. By comparison, like when SimCity came out on the SNES, it graphically, in terms of its presentation, was spectacular compared to the original MS-DOS version. MS-DOS version still looks great, but the SNES version had a degree of polish to it that made playing that version and a very different experience in a pleasant way that the super that the DOS version was not. Not to say the DOS version is bad, but that it was a very different experience. This is just rough. To put it another way, at this point, Descent 1, the first 3D six degrees of movement shooter, was two years old. Old. Well, not even 365 degrees of movement shooter was two years old. The game, the, now, the computers that were state of the art when Descent 1 came out were probably were a little out of date, or more than a little out of date at this point, but they still could run 3D games fine and certainly would have no problems running SimCity 2000 at that point at this point. In fact, even games that, uh, computers that would have had a bit of a rough time with Descent would have run SimCity 2000 fine. For that matter, I've looked up footage of SimCity 2000 on the PlayStation. And while it's scrolling is chuggy, it is superior in every respect to this. As it is, if you are looking back, honestly, if you're looking for a console port of SimCity in 1996, the PlayStation and Saturn versions are right there. They're just better. In a lot of respects, this shows how bad, not bad, but that how far everything is gone and that this NES truly is on the way out at this point in terms of for trying to do cutting edge-ish stuff. Honestly, though, that said, frankly, considering the roughness that the PlayStation version has, the fact that with the way computers are now, you can run SimCity 2000 just fine um, right now and on anything you have you can get like in terms of like like you could probably run it find a way to run it on your phone and it would run great i'm surprised nobody's tried to figure out a way to run it on a phone but you do it when the steam link handheld whatever um comes out the name of the device escapes me It'll run SimCity 2000 great. It's not, but... And also, you can probably buy SimCity 2000 from the Origin Store, possibly, I believe, also on GOG for super cheap, assuming it isn't being given away for free on various points when you go to get it. There's no reason not to play SimCity 2000 on the PC because it will play 300 times better than PlayStation version. It will play like play the PlayStation version, not the SNES version. It'll play and night and day from the SNES version. 
there's no good reason to play this, this NES version outside of pure curiosity. In our last epic strategy column, we have more notes on strategy for Lufia 2, specifically for the capsule monsters from the game and where you can find them. I remind you that the capsule monsters in Lufia 2 predate Pokemon, at least they're released in the US. Our next game we're covering is Maui Mallard in Cold Shadow, one of the last of the Disney platformers, at least on, you know, 16-bit consoles, with notes and maps for a lot of the game's levels. Maui Mallard handles the concept of the hyperfluid platformer better than some of the other games we've done so far. Hyperfluid, referring to the high level of character animation on the main character sprites, giving them lots of expressivity, but without getting into the deliberativeness of a cinematic platformer like Prince of Persia. Again, less Prince of Persia, more, say, Earthworm Jim. The controls of the game generally work well, and the level designs are somewhat intuitive. Where the game falls down is that you have to successfully complete mini games in order to get those password, get the passwords, you know, to continue on your next play session that you normally get just given to you, like with other games for the history of, you know, consoles. That I find this utterly inexcusable. Okay, and normally, like again, bonus continues having to earn those through play. I don't like it, but I get it. But just passwords, if you're having a password system, most other games, they just give them to you. you don't have to go through any stupid shenanigans to get them. So this is, this is dumb. Bonus stages exist to give the player a leg up on the next stage, give them bonus items to help them ease their way, to give them to get a whole bunch of extra lives and stock up on those. Not to just allow for basic functionality. I am intensely disappointed and annoyed with the developer on this. This is definitely a point where I'm like, yeah, um... Whatever the game developer's intent was, as far as for difficulty, feel free to subvert that by just slapping in a Game Genie and some cheats for unlimited lives or whatever. Or unlimited time for the bonus stages. Or, hell, just don't take damage, because screw this. In Counselor's Corner, we have notes on several secrets for Final Fantasy III. We have an arcade compilation pack for the SNES, for with develop ah, with a bunch of Williams arcade games, particularly Defender 1 and 2, Robotron, Joust, and Sinistar. So first off, a weird issue with the copy I'm playing. The game automatically starts whenever a game is selected after about one second and doesn't give you an option to select an option in the menu. This feels like because I'm playing using an emulator, Egan, um literally the last version before Nier's unfortunate passing. We don't look at software level anti piracy men, and considering Egan's well, like, very well lauded level of compatibility for Super Nintendo games in particular, that, that's how it started. This doesn't feel like a quirk of the end. It's really like anti piracy stuff. So, but otherwise, the game plays well. Robotron even manages to pull off what would now be done with twin stick movement and shooting by using the base button to handle which direction to shoot. Um, this was also done in Smash TV, but it feels like it's done better in Egan. These are, frankly, arcade perfect ports of these games to a degree that they really well and truly showcase how well the SNES can run a lot of these old titles. How much better it can run them than the NES can. I honestly could just as easily, based on these games, see Namco starting the Namco Museum collection on the SNES as on the PlayStation, based on the quality of these Williams ports, for like some of the early Namco games like Mappy, that sort of thing. Maybe even Dubious. Next is Wiz, a isometric platformer from Titus with an article having a bunch of level maps. 
the background of the guide is a really bad choice with this font showing the classic pattern of terrible, terrible desktop publishing choices with Nintendo power. It's been a while since they did something this bad. Okay. It's been a few issues since they did something this bad, but normally not at the guide level or it's been a while since the guide level, I guess I'd say. Anywho, as far as the game itself goes, isometric platformers, as I've said for a long time, something I haven't had to say since back, you know, the, the NES days are almost always bad. And Wiz is absolutely no exception. It has slippery movement that feels very hard to control, positioning that is awkward to move with, enemies which randomly drop power down or damage items. Uh, and on top of that, level time limits that are disturbingly short. Now, again, this could be a, well, anti-piracy thing, since we're getting just into the start of emulation, of NES emulation in particular, particularly thanks to um, ROM dumpers becoming a little more available. But still, that just makes for an unfun game to play and disincentivizes me from, you know, wanting to pick up the actual physical cartridge of this. Finally, our last game of the issue is the Game Boy version of Battle Arena Toshinden, a 2D port on the Game Boy of a 3D fighter from the PlayStation 1 and Saturn. The game that was, or frankly, posed up against or pitted up against Tekken as the king of the 3D fighters on the, on the PlayStation and also for that matter, as far as for which console to pick up against, you know, Virtua Fighter. So we'll see how this goes. Well, the Game Boy version of Battle Arena Toshinden has some solid ideas to it. It does a pretty decent job of finding a way to replicate a ring out mechanic from the, from the 2D game, from the 3D game by having the player give, have to give several hits against the edge of the stage before ring out happens. And it looks like, if I understand how the mechanics rate from playing it, each combo counts as a single hit. So you can't ring out an opponent on just one combo. The controls though are a little rough. Um, B button handles weapon attacks and A button handles unarmed attacks. But with the size of the sprites and the attack range of the two types, isn't much of a reason to use the melee attacks. Additionally, the balance of some of the fighters is a little rough, at least when they're controlled by the AI. Bow's attacks in particular do a tremendous amount of damage if they catch you, and the AI on normal can bust them out pretty quickly, but going through the control motions, we're talking like half circle forward, like, you know, Zangief motion. So, it's an actual play, this would probably be something a little trickier to play. AI balance in fighting games, single player is always kind of a mixed bag, depending on the platform. In the now playing column are also ran as the Game Boy port of Magic Boy, which I think I remember from the NES, from, if it's the same game I'm thinking of. In any case, we have on Pack Watch a look at Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey, along with a slew of other sports games uh, coming out for all variety of Nintendo devices. So my pick of the issue is going to be Maui Mallard, but only if you're playing on a device that supports safe states like the Retron 5 or the Polymega or using a Game Genie code to give you, you know, infinite time on bonus stages because honestly, were you requiring you to win on a bonus stage to get a continue is kind of BS to be honest. Um, other than that, to Shinden on the GB, um, particularly if you're playing it with like, once the thing comes out, the analog pocket, so you can play it on the go, um, that way. Otherwise, it's slim pickings this episode in terms of for actual games that came out. Um, like even stuff like the Williams Arcade Great, maybe Williams Arcade Greatest Hits. Assuming for the moment that, I mean, yeah, my unreserved recommendation, assuming that 
any DRM issues that I had, any weirdness with game selection was exclusive to emulation and won't happen on any clone console, won't happen on any uh, FPGA implementation, that it just works. Um, the Williams Arcade Greatest Hits. Though, again, even then... There are later, better collections for those games. Robotron is something that plays better with a, frankly, actual second analog stick to handle aiming. Defend with Defender. Defender, Defender one and two probably play the best. Joust was mashy. I mean, it like mashy beyond the ways that it was normally the. Button inputs didn't really feel, feel quite responsive enough when it comes to actually, you know, flapping the uh, wings on your ostrich. It's like it's just general, like kind of, it's kind of not a great issue in terms of recommendations. It's either stuff we've already reviewed, stuff that hasn't come out yet, like Blast Core, and. Like, we're ending the Epic Center column. Like, we're, we're ending the Epic Center possibly until the Game Boy Advance comes out, assuming they truck it back, they, they pop it back out then, once we start getting more RPGs on the GBA. It's... We are potentially entering a dark patch. We shall see how things fare with future game, with future N64 releases. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.